Hello, watchers and listeners in internet land. We have a special treat today for any poetry buffs in our audience. Today's guest is John F. McMullen, the Poet Laureate of Yorktown, New York. When John is not Poet Laureating, or is it like Attorneys General? Poeting Laureating? That doesn't sound right either. How about Poeting Laureate? Anyway, the use of words is something John is intimately familiar with because when he's not writing poetry, he has an adjunct professor and has been a full professor. He hosts a weekly radio show at www.johnmac13.com, and all of the links to John's work will be underneath his interview on this page. Maybe because he's done so many radio shows, he can help me do better interviews. Anyway, he, in addition to all that, he organizes poetry events in both his and other areas. He's worked with fellow poet laureates to bring weekly workshops to all ages. He's been interviewed in print, radio, and now here. I've seen some of John's work, and it has, to me, a deeply patriotic flair. Please welcome John F. McBollin, Poet Laureate of Yorktown, New York. Welcome. That's the cheering section. Okay, John, thank you for being here. I do appreciate it. You are the first poet that has taken the plunge, so bear with me if my questions are a little odd. Um, and it, it, with your permission, I'm going to just get right into it. Is that okay? That's fine. Very good. In previous discussion, John, you told me you were an English major in school and then spent 50 years in technology. What was the path that got you into poetry? It was very similar to the pet that got me into technology. I was an English major. I didn't know anything about computers. I had no interest in computers. And I went to Iona College in New Rochelle. And a friend asked me if, if I was going to take the government test. I had no interest to work for the government, and I told him so. But he said, well, you know, there's something to fall back on. And besides, you can drive me up by the car. And he didn't. So I, I agreed. I drove him up, took the test, uh, and for almost a year, I'd be getting things in the mail to be the border guard and uh, here and do something else here. And I was going to law school in the evening, and I was ignoring them. After approximately a year, uh, the Bloom was going off law school with real property classes and others, and I received this telegram from the Department of the Army asking me to try out, be interviewed for a brand new Department of Defense Management internship program to be headquartered at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. And, and I went and I, I wound up being, being one of the four people. And then I got to spend uh, six months walking around working in different areas. And I and I uh, and and then they asked me where did I want to work? And the most intelligent people, the smartest people that I met were in the computer area. So I said, "How about there?" And uh, they took me there. Then that started the career. The career took me to Wall Street. It took me to meeting my wife. It took me to being being lucky as as I was leaving Morgan Stanley to be standing by the elevator when the friend asked me if I had seen the computer on Ben Rose's desk. I said, how do you put a computer on the desk? Because I was a large computer system person. I went to look at it. I saw my first Apple computer. That got us into, a, into training and consulting uh, for years with microcomputers. It also got us into writing and to teaching. So I was very lucky there. Uh, and and I wrote columns uh, for magazines and, and for newspapers, including 212 columns for the now defunct Westchester Guardian that went out of business under me. Uh, but I happened to be walking through the bookstore. Now, I mentioned uh, I was an English major. Uh, from the time I graduated, not only hadn't I written any poetry, I hadn't read any poetry and had no interest in it for years. But I was, I was in, in Barnes & Noble in Mohegan Lake, New York. 
And I was coming from the restroom and I happened to walk through the poetry section and there was a book uh, with a very strange title. So I picked it up and I brought it over to, over to the cafeteria area or, or as they call it, the, uh, uh, the coffee shop. And I started to browse through it and it was by Charles Burkowski. And Charles Burkowski is a crazed poet. He's, he's awesome, a dead poet. And I said, this fellow is crazy. I could do this. And I wrote a poem and I, uh, and, and I put it away and I showed it to a friend and I was told I should enter it into a contest. And, and I did. And it was the national contest and I, f I forgot all about it. And uh, about eight months later, he sent me an email saying, uh, you, won, you won fourth prize. The fourth prize was $25 and a subscription to Poets and Writers magazine. But that was either an inspiration or, or a curse because then I started writing. And, and writing and writing and writing. And, and as you mentioned earlier, I have um, a, a, a book of, of my new and, and collected poetry, 110 poems. And I also have the whole bunch of, of short chapbooks. And I have a few more in progress. That, that then led me to talking to the town because on, on my radio show, I've been interviewing a few poet laureates like Alecky Barnstone, the poet laureate of, uh, of Missouri. And I, uh, so I said, well, these other places, poet laureates, uh, Orange County has one, Beacon has one, Yorktown should have one. And I said, okay, you're it. And since then, I've been putting together uh, workshops. I've been trying to arrange other programs. Uh, the idea of a poet laureate is to number one, to uh, interest the community in poetry. Two, it is to provide ways of, of training or, or of interest, and also to, to publicize poetry, uh, different venues, different places to read, to be able to learn. So, so I'm, I've been doing that. Okay, that's amazing. You have written, if I have the count correct, five books of poetry. One you just mentioned, the 110 poem collection, four chat books, two other books, and over 2,000 magazine, newspaper, and related articles. What is your entire range of writing? Well, I started out writing on on technology. Uh, they asked they asked the the people to develop the first spreadsheet, VisiCalc, uh, to write an article about the juices for the magazine. Uh, Dan Bricklin, uh, who was a friend, said they don't do that, but they should speak to Barbara McMullen, who knows more about this than anyone else. Barbara's my wife. Uh, so they contacted her. She wrote the, uh, the article. I edited it. Then... Uh, then up uh, the book publisher John Wiley asked us to write something on telecommunication because we were some of, of of the early users of online communications, and and we did that, and from then on I did the majority of the writing and uh, and she does the editing, and that led to pieces in a uh, in in PC magazine to Infoworld to. Uh, uh, computer Shopper, to Chicago Tribune, to mm -hmm. National Review, all on technology. As, as things went along, I stopped writing really technical articles about reviews and everything and wrote about how the technology uh, was changing the world around us without us even realizing it. And so we walk through the mall and we see there, there, there are no more music stores. There, there are no more camera stores. Uh, that we see the, the person down the block has lost his job and he was a hundred and and seventy five thousand dollar executive at Kodak and uh, to what do these people do to what happens to jobs when when if you walk into the bank uh, where there are eight telestations there's only two people working because of online banking because of, of the ATM machines so that was what I was writing for Westchester Guardian until till they went away. 
uh, the poetry, as I mentioned, became an afterthought. But that's the majority of, of the writing that I do now because it's, it runs around in my head and then I'll come, I'll either be writing on the piece of paper at, at the meeting that I'm at or, or I'll be writing at the bookstore and, and, and then I'll come home and I'll, I'll put it into a computer. <laughs> Incredible. I personally have often thought that poetry is the most difficult literary form. Do you have a peeve about poetry? Is it difficult for you? It's not because I tend to write in the very non-obtruse way. I write in plain English, in blank verse, and I write from my own thoughts and experiences. I find the most difficult thing to write are short stories because unlike a novel, you're not you're not able to spend a lot of time in in character development, in building an environment, in building the plot. You all have to do it in in a fairly short platform. So so I find that the most difficult. Uh, now I also and I've written about this. I in my nonfiction I write to tell people what I know. In fiction, I write to, to tell stories. I grew up in an, an Irish Catholic beer drinking bar neighborhood, uh, and and it was a storytelling neighborhood. So that's that's my experience. Poetry, I really write for myself, and I hope that that people like it. But if they don't, that's okay too. Uh, I'm writing to explore to what I'm feeling or to what I'm thinking. So that's that's also very different to me. Understood. What was the most useful thing you learned when you were learning to write? And the other side of that, what was the most destructive or least useful thing you picked up learning to write? Oh, well, I started writing when I was extremely young. I was, I was a sports fan and I would write things from myself about baseball players, about teams. Uh, and I wrote all through high school. And, and I also, in my professional life, uh, I wrote uh, not only for myself, but for people higher up than me that would ask me to write the memo for them or explaining something. So I didn't have difficulty writing. Uh, my hardest thing probably is, is confining myself to a word count or, or, or something else because I tend to want to tell a story from beginning to end. And, and for instance, I've just had an opportunity to write something about my experiences and, and, and I talked about me writing something about what I said before about happening to be at the right place at, at, at the right time, whether it be uh, driving up to school to take the government test or standing by an elevator or other things. And, uh, but the, um, the venue was, uh, was limited to three or four hundred words. And, I, and it just didn't work out uh, for me to tell all those stories in that time. In that space, rather. Okay. Are poems fully formed in your head? You mentioned writing notes when you're at meetings, putting things on a piece of paper, and then transferring them to, to the computer. So, are poems fully formed in your head before you write them? Do they change as you're doing this transfer from paper to computer? Is there more logic, or do you write from intuition, or or both, or what? That's hard to pinpoint, but generally, it's an idea, and I'll scribble some lines toward the poem. Then, when, then when I get to a computer, very often, number one, some of the words change, and also as as I start to get to the end of the poem, the conclusion may change, or I may express it differently. I may leave something hanging where before in my mind I came to, to the closing point or just the opposite. I may want to come to the closing point before I uh, 
I quit. Okay. Now I'm going I'm, I'm to put you on the spot now. Uh, so feel free to say no. Would you be willing to share some of your work in progress, your poetry in progress? Uh, I, I don't have that handy, but I, but I, I do have um, my, most, my most recent chat book here. I also have the, uh, have, have the, uh, the new one collected poems. If you'd like me to, to pick the poem from that, I'll be happy to. Just please, and, you know, what poem do you like the best? Ah, uh, that's which uh, which child do you like the best? Uh, <laughs> uh, that's very hard to uh, to explain. Let's see. Okay. In this book you're reading from, this is available on Amazon. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. They're all available on Amazon. Uh, very we'll have links at the bottom of the interview for all our watchers and listeners. Okay. All right. This is a tongue-in-cheek poem that I've, I've read at, at some various places called Poetry Readings. I read poetry a lot now, here and other places. At the conclusion of each poem, people smile and laugh, even clap. When I finish all the poems I read, they do it again. This makes me feel pretty good, pretty good. I'd feel really good if they bought the goddamn books. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I ask you for one more? Okay. Let's, let's see what else we have. Yeah, I, I read regularly at poetry readings, and, and one of the venues that I... I go to very often. It's a terrific place. It's in Sleepy Hollow, New York, the Hudson Valley Writers Center. And you have a five minute limit. Now, that was no problem with poems, but I read at a, uh, a short story and it, it, it didn't go well. I had to, to be cut off. So uh, at, at the next month, I, I had open mic too. Open mic. A month after my bomb here at, at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, this went much better. Four poems in five minutes, and Dan didn't have to cut me off. The rest of the night went very well as, as Jim, Roxy, Joe, Dadel, Sashi, and others turned in solid performances. It made me realize that we were very lucky that, that the first open mic didn't put a death knell on, on, on the whole idea. As Prairie Home Companions, Doris, Doris and Caleb tell us a story that he would never make it up. The first open mic was held in Florence, Italy, about 1300. The first reader, a bit nervous, got up and said, good evening, I have, I have three poems to read. My name is, is Duante Delagiri, but you can call me Dante. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I'm impressed. For whatever that's worth. What is something memorable that you've heard from your readers and fans? Uh, would you repeat that, Joseph? I didn't hear the last word. What is something memorable you've heard from your readers and fans? Uh, that I write, uh, that I tend to usually have the punchline. And it tends to be ironic and, and, and to get people to laugh or to, or to go, ooh, I didn't expect that. So that's the, uh, that tends to be what people identify with my, with my poems. Now, they're not all like that, but that's, uh, I, I, I attend a, a weekly writers group at, at the Mayapaka Library. And uh, and uh, and and people in the group, when I read, tend to expect that. I can understand. What do you enjoy about writing? What's the least favorite part for you about writing? I don't have any any the least favorite parts. Um, when I wrote the publication, I tended to be able to write extremely well on deadline. Now, part of that had to do that for a year I was I was 
uh, the East Coast editor for an online technology nerds news service called News Bytes. And then I had to turn 25 articles out every week. Uh, so I enjoy writing. Uh, I don't have any any problems uh, uh, writing, making a uh, making deadline. If, after writing all those weekly columns, I uh, I was able to, to once I had an idea, to get it down on paper to this large conclusion. Uh, I think the best thing is when I finish something that I'm that I'm proud of, even if I don't remember it a year later when I go back to my uh, to my book of 110 poems. There are some poems that I I don't remember. But as I read them, I say, you know, this is pretty good. You know, this is okay. What is on your must-read shelf? Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of different things. I, I tend to read a lot of mysteries. Uh, and and, uh, and I have a, I have a three-story house that is, that is chock full of books. And um, my wife says there is, there is no place for any other of the books in this house so I tend to read fiction on a Kindle uh, as 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 for poetry books I tend to to pick up things like there's a terrific book by Matthew Zeruda on on why poetry that's uh, extremely well done uh, I pick up things that I haven't read if there's anything by Charles Bukowski or Sharon Olds. I don't read as many technology books as 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 I used to because I'm not that active in the business anymore. Okay. I mentioned in the introduction that the the poems that you had shared with me seem to be patriotic. Is patriotism an overarching theme in all of your work, or or was I fortunate enough to find to be given two poems? I don't. I don't. I don't really think it's in any of it. Uh, I do. I do. For instance, I. I. I just did the reading at the wonderful uh, three weekend uh, veterans gala that was held in uh, in in Bruce, New York, by the Putnam County Vet Vet to Vet Group, and I wrote I wrote two poems for that, and I had I had two older poems. Uh, I think that. They may be patriotic, but it's as the spirit moves me. It's it's whatever happens to be on, on my mind at the time. So it's more aimed at uh, at at the world the world around me. I have the poem that's uh, uh that talks about this uh this this, this state park that's or supposed state park that's at the top of my hill in Mayapack, New York. And the reason it's a supposed state park is there's absolutely nothing there. There, there are big sign on on the highway saying there are, but there is not a uh, the nature walk. There aren't basketball courts. There's not a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. There's not a parking lot, and it's known as the Donald J. Trump Indian Hill Campus of of, of his state park, <laughs> and so that's. Uh, a rather anti-administration poem, but I don't think that makes me less patriotic. I would agree. What advice would you give other poets? Well, the best book on writing that I've I've ever read is Stephen King's book on writing, and it's uh, and and any. Annie Lamont's book, uh, *Bird Bird by Bird*, is a is 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 a cloak second, and it's number one. Read, 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 read everything. Two is is to write, write, write as often as possible. The uh, the coordinator of, of of my writing group gets up at three o'clock in the morning to write. Uh, so and and to some people, it's it's. It's extremely important to be on a fixed schedule, to always write at the same time. Years ago, I interviewed Mary Higgins Clark, the mystery writer, and she got up at, at six every morning and she wrote until lunchtime. Then, then if, if she had the luncheon out of the house, 
that was the end of her writing day. If she didn't, then she wrote afterwards. And, uh, and, and these will turn out hundreds, hundreds of books. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a do it. Mm -hmm. Listen to, to other people. I never, I never thought in, until I started going to these uh, poetry workshops that I could gain much by listening to other people commenting on my work. Because as I mentioned, I write for myself. But I have had some very good criticism that have caused me to change the ending on a poem, to drop something off, to use another word. And so that's been very helpful. Excellent. You mentioned <clears throat> some must-read authors, must-read poets that, you're, that you like. So if you have a partner project, who would you want to co-write with and why? And anything but poetry, it would be it would, it would, it would be Pete Hamill. I think I think that Pete Hamill turns a word and a phrase better than anyone I know, whether it's in his columns, his novels, or his autobiography. So for poetry, it would probably be Sharon Olds, who who I really like. I can't write with Charles Bukowski because he's not with us anymore. So uh, to probably Sharon Olds. Okay. What is your favorite place to visit? Is there, is there some place that is your inspiration place? No, my inspiration is, comes from within, but it's, but it's based on where I happen to be at the present time, whether it's in the meeting, whether it's in the bookstore, whether it's, it's in my house, whether it's looking at, my pets uh so it it's not no now we do spend the week at, at the jersey shore every year and i find that relaxing and and i tend to pump out a lot of work because uh i have but my son calls cheap our skin which leads me uh, uh, uh to skin cancer so i uh, i stay out of the sun and, and i write so Okay. If you could have lunch with anyone from history, who would it be and why? One person? Yes, one person. Theodore Samuel Williams, the best hitter that I ever saw and one of the most interesting people that I, I ever read about, who is, uh, whose head is, is, is frozen when they could... Uh, could repair him, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> if you could have been the author of any book ever written, which book would it be? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, things come to mind like the Bible, like us, uh, uh, biographies of, of, of Stephen Jobs. Uh, but probably A Drinking Life by Peter Hamill. Peter Hamill seems to be a favorite of yours. You mentioned him a few times. He okay. is. Okay, excellent. Um, we're, coming, we're coming up on the close. I have two more questions for you, sir. By your own statements, from what you've shared with me prior to this interview and talking through this interview, you have obviously lived a full, very rich life. What is number one item? What's the number one item on your bucket list? Interesting. Uh, to win the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Okay. I like a man with goals and ambitions. Good. Good for you. Last question, sir. And I want, before I ask it, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, as I say, thank you very course, much. My pleasure. You're the first poet and definitely the first poet laureate. And this has been a wonderful interview from my point of view. Here's the question. What question do you wish that someone would ask about you or your books, your poetry, but nobody has? The ones that I ask myself that people haven't asked me is why do you write? And I can answer that uh, 
but I'd like to have have someone come up and say, boy, I really like this. Why do you write like this? And then I tell them. I really like what you write. Why do you write like this? Because I have to. Uh, Sharon Olds said that, uh, that, that writing is very hard, and, but it's harder not to write. And I agree completely. Very good. John F. McMullen, Poet Laureate of Yorktown, New York. Thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. Love to have a conversation with you again when you get that Pulitzer Prize thing going. That would be wonderful. I, you know, let me be the first. Thank you so much, sir. Have a great day. And thank you very much, Joseph. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.